Um, thanks for joining tonight. We want to welcome you to Smilo Shares with Primary Care. Tonight our focus is on uh, GI cancers, uh, and we've got a great staff available, um, great faculty tonight um, that are going to that are going to talk about issues around GI cancers. And um, uh, my name is Ann Chang. Uh, my partner um, in establishing this series is Karen Brown, and we are here to welcome you to this monthly lecture, and many of you have been with us before. Um, this came about really through discussions between Karen, myself, and others, um, focusing on the primary care perspective on cancer. Uh, there are a lot of venues where you can get cancer information, but this is intended to really uh, partner with primary care and, and um, as cancer specialists to to focus on those issues that are most in interesting to you and most pertinent to you. Uh, so uh, we'll, it, it's a, as you know, a, a case-based discussion. We have three cases tonight that we're gonna get, try to get through uh, and to highlight certain key clinical pearls and, and, and certainly the advances for, for you to know about. Um, so we'll do our introductions first and then we will go into the case presentations. And then we always like to have about 10 minutes available for your questions and answers. So either uh, put them into the chat or else keep them for the end. Uh, that's always the really interesting and, and important part. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll definitely leave time for that. Um, Karen, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and, and, uh, and start with the introductions? Sure, thank you. So um, for those who don't know me, my name is Karen Brown. I'm an internist uh, in, in North Haven at the Divine Street Complex and the medical director of NEMG Primary Care. I am thrilled to um, introduce uh, two of my colleagues who have collaborated um, in making this talk uh, something that will be really applicable to primary care, uh, focusing on diagnosis, um, and and uh, the kind of intersections between primary care and oncology. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Allard, who we call Beth, um, is originally from Wisconsin. She received her undergrad degree from Carnegie Mellon in um, biology. And then she received both a PhD in pathobiology and an MD from Brown University. Uh, she broke the usual MD PhD mold and completed her residency in family medicine at UMass Medical School in Worcester at an inner city health clinic. She's been employed by a prior hospital owned family practice, then spent 15 years in private practice and is now um, a, a very valued member of our Northeast Medical Group uh, primary care team. And she runs an all female family practice in Waterford. She creates care with a thoughtful and scientific framework She's a leader in her practice um, and in her geographic region, and she's a member of the primary care steering group where her insight helps to guide all of us um, as we uh, build systems of primary care. Dr. Scott Thornton attended uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and completed his residency at UConn um, and in the colorectal surgery at um, Muhlenberg Regional Medical Center. He is also a Northeast Medical Group physician. Uh, he's a colon and rectal surgeon in, in Shelton, uh, Connecticut, right next to our walk-in, which is a convenient location. Uh, and he has a Bridgeport Hospital affiliation. He's well-respected by colleagues. He's cared uh, for patients with um, colon and rectal cancer for nearly 30 years. His professional interests include laparoscopic colorectal surgery, uh, rectal and hemorrhoidal issues, and he is an avid golfer when he is outside of the office. I'll turn it over to you, Anne, to introduce your Smilo colleagues. Thank you. And I, I should say I'm a medical oncologist and associate cancer director for clinical initiatives. Um, so I'm going to start with Dr. Amit Khanna, who is an associate professor of surgery at Yale School of Medicine, and he's the director of colorectal surgery for the Bridgeport Hospital region. Um, and as such, he's responsible for leading uh, the provision of, of colorectal surgical sur services across the area in collaboration with the Digestive Health Service Line and Smile Cancer Hospital Network teams. Um, Dr. Khanna has more than 20 years of experience as a high volume surgeon, and he spe specializes in the minimally invasive treatment and management of inflammatory bowel disease, colorectal malignancies, and anorectal diseases. 
Um, Dr. Pam uh, Kunz is Associate Professor of Medicine uh, and Director of the Center for Gastrointestinal Cancer at Yale Cancer Center and SMILO. Uh, she joined us at Yale from, SMI uh, from Stanford University, where she was the Director of the Neuroendocrine Tumor Program there and leader of Ind in Endocrine Oncology Research Group um, and the Director of the Neuroendocrine Tumor Fellowship. Um, but beyond her record of accomplishment in GI oncology, uh, Dr. Kunz is an international leader in the clinical care of patients with neuroendocrine tumors, or called NETS, and she's also advancing the field through clinical trials and translational science that is really defining the next generation of therapies for patients with this rare diagnosis. Um, and then finally, Dr. Justin Persico is an assistant professor of clinical medicine uh, in the section of medical oncology, and he's the director of Smilo Cancer Hospital Care Centers in Trumbull and Fairfield. He focuses his clinic on the care of patients with GI cancers, and his specific interests include research on lifestyle factors that impact pathogenesis, treatment, and survivorship of colorectal cancer patients. He attended Tufts University School of Medicine, where he also completed his fellowship in HEMOC. So our distinguished faculty, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Allard to start with our first case, thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. So um, we wanna be begin with talking about cases and it's probably no great surprise that this is colon cancer month and that a lot of people are probably going to be uh, expecting a colon cancer case. So I might as well just put it out there up front. Um, but we're gonna try to take each case this afternoon and focus on it in a different way. So we're gonna focus on this one pretty thoroughly because we know colon cancer is so common. So we begin our story with a 45 year old woman with a past history of arthritis and elevated cholesterol. She presents for a complete physical exam. She's a non-smoker who drinks three glasses of wine per day. And the question of the hour is, does this patient need colon cancer screening? And we all know that five years ago, three years ago, we would have said probably not unless there was a risk, but now things have changed. Um, and before I go forward on this case, um, let's look at pathways. So if we look closely, now that we have these wonderful pathways in our system at EPIC, as um, ambulatory care uh, continues to advance, we have three ways to look at colon cancer screening. The first one we'll look at in greater detail is obviously initial screening, but then there's screening for someone who has had a, a previous normal evaluation and then for someone who's had an abnormal. And we all know that the GI doctors come up with these recipes of how often to screen, but I think it's great to have access to all of this so we can look at it. Let's move on to our next slide. So once we're in pathways and we go to the initial screening pathway, this is what it looks like. So if you're seeing a patient and you're not certain what to do or whether they're eligible, you look up this pathway through the, through the pathway system and the colon cancer initial screening at the very top has two items. The first is asking whether or not this patient is a candidate for screening. And yes, in general, healthy patients between the ages of 45 and 75 are recommended screening um, or anyone with a life expectancy of greater than 10 years. On the flip side, you might be asking who isn't a candidate. And again, details are there, but anyone obviously with any chronic or terminal illness such as cancer and stage heart failure, we're not gonna put them through a colonoscopy because we know that that's a significant risk to them. And likewise, if we're gonna treat a colon cancer and they already have this concomitant illness, it may just be too much. Next step on the flow diagram is, um, you know, additional details of who is high risk. So we know people with a first degree relative with cancer of the colon or polyps of the colon is at higher risk, as well as people with irritable bowel disease and people with certain genetic syndromes. Final step on the pathway, quick look. There are several ways we can screen. Before COVID, we mostly focused on the colonoscopy. Since COVID, I myself and others have certainly considered more of the options that are available uh, that don't involve such an invasive procedure, per particularly Cologuard. But for the purposes of this conversation, uh, we're not gonna go into more detail at this point. So let's move back to our case in the next slide. So um, the patient underwent her screening colonoscopy. I do wanna note that it took a whole year. And that brings up a point for us PCPs. Our job is to look at that health maintenance list all the time. And if you see someone who is due for something, talk to them about it, whether it's their you know, preventative health maintenance visit 
or it might even be a visit for something else. We, it's our job to get these folks to screening. So she had the screening and it revealed a large tubular adenoma greater than 10 millimeters. And the patient was recommended for repeat screening in three years. I'm gonna to turn to our next slide, which is gonna show us in the pathways, if you've had an abnormal colonoscopy, now what do you do? So it may be hard to see this on all of your screens, but this basically goes through the details of depending on the, what the findings are, how frequently the next colonoscopy needs to occur. And in her particular case, because it was a large adenoma, it's recommended that she undergo screening again in three years. But another little sub point here, um, this particular patient didn't listen to her PCP right away and again, spent another year deciding whether or not to do this. But fortunately, when she saw her primary care physician one year later, she was willing to go forward with the procedure. So let's turn to our next slide. So here, she's had the initial colonoscopy that reveals the tubular adenoma. It's four years later, she's finally going for that repeat screening. She feels great, she has no symptoms, she's not concerned. She undergoes repeat colonoscopy. And unfortunately, a transverse mass was found in her colon. Pathology report revealed adenocarcinoma of the colon. And in a moment, we're gonna hear more from our surgeon about what the next steps are. I do wanna stop for a minute and give a personal thanks to Dr. Rochelle Andre, who assisted me with coming up with this particular case, which we use today. Okay, Amit, fill us oh. in. What do we need to do? Thanks so much, Beth. Um, so, um, you know, this is a very common story. This is something that all of you see and, and unfortunately um, uh, our patients. And um, I just wanna uh, talk a little bit about how to help with making that preoperative evaluation easier so that you can help guide your patients through this process as it's always a challenging one for them, but we also wanna take out any of the mystery of helping to support your patients um, once they are diagnosed with colon cancer. So if we could go to the next slide, um, you know, if we just think about colon cancer broadly, you know, where does everyone fall? Well, about 65% of patients are going to have sporadic disease. And I think one of the most common questions I, I get from primary care doctors is, you know, do they need a genetics evaluation? How important is that family history? Well, most of our colon cancer patients are going to have sporadic disease, but a significant amount of them will have a familial component, which means that there isn't an actual germline mutation that we see, um, but, but we know that it's running in a family and that they have a family history. And then the thing that we, we see, you know, sort of less commonly, but, but we do find more and more frequently are actual hereditary genetic defects. And I think the other part of it from a primary care perspective is how can we help our patients um, get the most efficient access to surgical care? How do we do that work up? And I think it's helpful for our prim primary care colleagues to understand, well, what is a complete workup? And um, there's a few questions that, that often get asked me. And I think the one is, you know, do we need to do a genetics evaluation before surgery? And I think in most cases, we don't. Um, but we will do that screening process when the patient gets referred in for their first surgical evaluation. And we're very lucky that we have a, a very robust um, genetics program at Smilo. And, um, and it's actually right on the campus where um, uh, Dr. Persico and myself certainly see patients. And so um, we're able to get patients in quite efficiently. Sometimes we don't have the results back before patients need to go through surgery. Um, but in most cases, uh, as you can see, you know, you know talking about 95% of patients, we don't need the information ahead of time, or we can make a decision based on the patient's previous history. So the things that are really important to us are previous genetic syndromes, previous polyps, um, age of diagnosis of their uh, colon cancer, um, obviously the CAT scans that, that uh, we perform, usually chest, abdomen, and pelvis, sometimes um, physicians will ask me, do I really need a CT of the chest? Uh, can I just use a uh, chest x-ray? And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important in a second. And then I think the last point here that's important to make is the idea that we take care of patients as teams. And so early multidisciplinary involvement is something that we really um, emphasize in care of our patients. And that's not just um, the surgeon, the oncologist, or, or radiation oncology, or 
um, genetics counselors. That's that's our primary care partners and our specialists. So we really have a, a, a lot of emphasis on making sure that we're optimizing these patients for surgery because that can really have a big impact on the approach that we might take. And also if there's any other interventions such as cardiac interventions or pulmonary interventions that, that may add value. Um, certainly management of anticoagulation around surgery is another big one. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so just these are some some pearls, I think, that are helpful um, just to think about, you know, as you're um, counseling your patients. And I always tell um, our patients when they come to see me, um, you've known me for 10 minutes, you've known your primary care doctor a lot longer. So it's really important that you reach out to your primary care physician and ask questions, you know, ask about your surgeon ask about the approach, the, the options that you have. And, and we look at that as a very important partnership. So a third of um, colon cancer patients may have, you know, some mutation. Um, and these are in the younger than 50 group. Um, CEA, which we will almost always do um, before surgery, um, does have a, a significant predictive value of overall survival. And so if you have an elevated CEA at diagnosis, you know, your, your hazard of death compared to patients with a normal CEA is, is, is um, you know, quite different. Um, in terms of the chest CT, um, we still do it, even though the risk of metastasis is quite low. Um, the, the yield um, allows us to see some indeterminate lesions that may need follow-up. Um, and so that, that's why we do it. And so universally, we ask for chest CTs. Um, Sometimes I get asked about a PET CT in the preoperative setting, and there are a, a few situations where we might do that, uh, but for the large uh, number of patients that present to us with colon cancer, that they're not undergoing um, PET CTs as a preoperative evaluation, so um, generally not needed. Um, next slide, please. And I think the other thing that I just want to quickly go over is um, the idea of trying to figure out what the right approach for any individual patient is. And I, you know, I often tell patients that customized care is quality care. We have guidelines um, and we have data that really helps us a ton to figure out which one of those custom uh, roles is going to be um, most helpful. Um, and, um, and, um, apologize for the background, um, and um, that these can be customized um, to the patient's best interest. So um, a robotic approach, um, a laparoscopic approach, or an open approach, all of those can be very appropriate. Um, and we really um, find that at least for right colon cancers, the, the, the outcomes are very similar. So oncologic outcomes here um, for robotic versus laparoscopic approaches, they have not been proven one to be superior over the other. That being said, pain, um, post-operative recovery, uh, length of stay, you know, those have definitely uh, been shown to be um, slightly in the advantage of a robotic approach, but uh, oncologically probably very similar. Um, the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is just about lymphadenectomy and the extent that we do, not to belabor this too much, uh, but the, the importance of um, doing a adequate lymphadenectomy with getting over 12 lymph nodes, um, but there's been some discussion and you might hear this in the literature or hear patients ask you about this, the idea of a complete mesocolic excision or an extended lymphadenectomy. And, you know, that's become uh, more and more um, uh, employed in Europe um, and in Asia. And um, right now in the United States, the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons has not ex, uh, recommended that we do a routine extended lymphadenectomy. But if we see you know, suspicious nodes outside of the normal field of our dissection, th there does seem to be data that we should go ahead and remove those. Um, and all that means is just doing sort of a little bit more of a Lymph, a lymph node dissection right on top of the superior mesenteric vein. But right now we're not, um, we're not advocating, or at least our, our, um, our guidelines don't advocate for us to do that routinely. And then the last thing I would say is that we, we really work hard to integrate our ERAS um, care signature pathways within um, our preoperative planning. So that really involves us um, making sure that 
you know, we've got our patients very well educated in the office on what they need to do before surgery and um, their expected discharge and what they need to do when they get home. And obviously all of this allows us to uh, hopefully get our patients um, home and, and back into your offices um, looking for the next steps. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Um, so this is uh, Justin Persico. I'm going to take it from here to continue the discussion. And I guess I should preface uh, the discussion that we that we are talking about colon cancer patients here. We we do segregate uh, rectal cancer patients um, into a different uh, category and think about them a bit a bit differently in terms of you know how we approach it. But for for your typical colon cancer patient, uh, the paradigm is you know typically to stage and to do surgery. Uh, and then uh, they would be referred to the medical oncologist. Uh, and I wanted to use this, this opportunity to sort of highlight uh, a couple of points that um, uh, sort of ch uh, uh, practice changes that have happened maybe in about the fi last five years uh, that might be important for you to know as you send your, your patients for a referral to us. Um, the, uh, uh, this, this case in particular is a, is a patient with a stage three uh, colon cancer. So the, uh, the data is uh, quite clear that those benefit those patients benefit uh, from adjuvant chemotherapy, um, but how we give it, uh, as well as uh, what we do with with earlier stage patients, particularly stage two patients, has has changed a bit. Um, I'll uh, I'll first uh, discuss stage two patients, even though that's uh, a little different than this uh, particular case. Um, but in the past, you know, medical oncologists have used. Um, clinical pathologic features to decide, you know, which patients within that stage would be at the highest risk because studies have failed to show consistently that all stage, stage two patients uh, benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, but we do know there are a subset who are at a significantly higher risk, um, and those patients really should get treatment. Um, in the past, we'd use these factors I've listed here, whether the patient presented with an obstructive tumor or a larger, a T4 tumor evading through the serosa of the colon, whether there's a, a risk factor like seeing lymphovascular invasion, even, even though we don't see lymph node invasion yet. Um, but this is largely, I think, going to be supplanted, uh, and this transition is already, already happening in oncology um, with what we call circulating tumor DNA testing. So, so this is a, a serum test, a blood test that we can do on patients when they are referred to us, uh, which would detect uh, whether there is actually cancer tumor DNA um, in the bloodstream. And, and as you might expect, this is a, this is a poor risk factor. Um, I um, uh, put in this recurrence-free survival curve from this uh, recent dynamic trial that was uh, published in New England Journal, Journal of Medicine. There's also other groups who have been working on, uh, on this technology um, and as you can see, the patients who did have detectable circulating tumor DNA did, did much worse. Uh, these are stage two patients. Um, and so uh, those patients are likely the best candidates uh, for, for adjuvant chemotherapy. And patients who tested negative had actually very excellent disease-free uh, survivals going out four years and beyond. Uh, and those patients probably don't, won't, won't benefit from chemotherapy. Um, so, so this is uh, emerging more and more. The main... Um, data that's still lacking here is just the confirmation that if these patients do test positive for circulating tumor DNA, do they benefit from chemotherapy? Uh, but we, we know, like I said, that there's a high-risk group. And, and this, this actually, this disease-free survival curve is one of the better ones. When you look at uh, some of the data from like what's, what's called the circulate um, trial, there's a, a few of those going on across the world. Uh, the, the outcomes are even worse uh, in their studies compared to this. Uh, and uh, we uh, actually at Yale had one uh, a clinical trial uh, called the COBRA trial. Actually, I think it might just be on pause, but it's an ongoing trial where we're looking at these stage two patients and then randomizing them to get treatment or not treatment, depending on the presence of circulating tu tumor DNA to try to answer that question. Um, so, so this is something your patients you know, may, may be coming across. Um, for stage three patients, like I mentioned, the data is quite clear that they benefit from chemotherapy. But what's happened in the last five to maybe 10 years now is there's been further uh, work on trying to um, separate out uh, patients that may not need uh, the typical recommendation, which would be six months uh, of adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, there is this uh, group called the uh, Ideal um, sorry, IDEA uh, trial analysis group that's taken the data from multiple adjuvant chemotherapy uh, studies uh, and 
I've come with uh, some pretty you know, in interesting results analyzing this. And the most significant here is that uh, they found patients who um, had lower earlier stage, stage three, stage three, eighth, stage three B with three or less lymph nodes um, had the same outcomes if they received three months of uh, adjuvant regimen where we use capecitabine and oxaliplatin compared to six months of traditional full Fox chemotherapy um, which is great because it's shorter duration and it uh, helps reduce the most feared, I think, long-term complication of these treatments, which is peripheral neuropathy. Um, rates of peripheral neuropathy with three months of chemotherapy are only about 10% compared to more than 60% with six months of, of chemotherapy. So, um, so this is uh, an example of how we've actually been able to, to reduce the, the treatment in certain circumstances. Uh, now, patients with more than three lymph nodes or other high-risk factors, like having tumor, separate tumor deposits from the primary tumor, uh, T4 tumors, these types of things, we still recommend you know they be treated more more aggressively as a high-risk patient uh, with with six months of of combination uh, chemotherapy. So, um, so with that, I think we can pass it back uh, for a discussion of case two. All right, Justin and Amit, thank you so much for expanding on what we see as primary care doctors and bringing, up, bringing us over to what happens when our patients leave our offices and start seeking care with the surgeons and medical oncologists that need to take care of them. Um, our next discussion is going to be um, a little bit different because um, we're going to spend some time talking about a case. We're going to talk a little bit about discussion points for us as primary care physicians, a little bit about the treatment of this disease, but we're going to bring it in a little bit of a different direction, which I think will be brought up in another of the Smile Shares programs coming up. So case two, we have a 75-year-old woman with a history of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, spinal stenosis, peripheral arterial disease. She's a former smoker who presented to her PCP with a two-month history of chest pain, epigastric pain, dysphagia, and 11 pound weight loss. She's very active and walks two miles per day, helps care for her grandchildren. On physical exam, she's thin, but otherwise looks good. Her lab work shows that her um, kidney functions are normal, LFTs are normal, except for a bump in her ALT to 40, and her hemoglobin is only seven. So every day of our lives, people walk in our offices, they have epigastric pain, they have chest pain, we're trying to figure out what to do with it. We use a lot of proton pump inhibitors and diet change and so forth. But what we need to learn as primary care physicians is to remember what are the symptoms in this case that raise concern? And what do we need to do when we see these warning signs that make us think that this isn't just another time to hand out the purple pill? So first discussion point, what are the symptoms in this case that raise concern? Obviously the 11 pound weight loss is kind of a standout and secondarily the hemoglobin of seven. We think malignancy, right? We think something big and bad is happening if the body is so affected as to cause weight loss and anemia. Um, and what we need to do at that point is these are the people that we're probably not gonna be really doing the medication trials with. We may put them on a medication, but we might say you really need to see uh, a GI specialist at this point. You really need to have some testing done. So if we could go to the next slide. So in our next slide, our patient did undergo testing and her CAT scan did show thickening of the GE junction, multiple liver metastases, pulmonary embolus of the left lower lobe. Ultrasound also showed in the left lower extremity an occlusive DVT. She underwent um, EGD and biopsy, which showed a mass poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, HER2 negative MSS PDL1 CPS greater than five. And this patient obviously is just a little bit more of an advanced situation than our last case, but let's hear from our oncologist, Dr. Pam Coons, about what she would do for this patient. Thank you, Pam. Great, thanks, Beth. Hi, everybody. So, um, you know, when I'm first meeting with a patient um, in a new patient visit, I try to go over and be really um, clear about what we're defining in terms of the stage of the disease. So this is a stage four or metastatic G-junction adenocarcinoma with liver metastases. Um, I define to the patient really what that means and what our goals of care are. So I, if, even in that first meeting, I would say the goals of care are to control the disease, but we will not be able to get rid of the disease. And then we talk about 
next steps in terms of what the treatment options are. This patient is robust enough to consider doing first-line chemotherapy. And um, before we get into that, I do want to define some of the um, acronyms that are used in this because I think it's just to for the you may see these in pathology reports. Um, so um, HER2 is and MSS are both standardly done now for most GI cancers. So HER2 is in the family of epidermal growth factor receptors about 15 to 20% of patients will be HER2 positive. This is more common uh, probably in the language of breast cancer that you may be familiar seeing this, but we do have targeted therapies for this for patients who are HER2 positive, um, including something called trastuzumab or Herceptin. MSS refers to microsatellite stability or microsatellite instability. We see this um, commonly, we see microsatellite instability with Lynch syndrome, which was mentioned in the earlier case, um, where again, testing this now routinely in all GI cancers. So this patient was microsatellite stable, therefore unlikely to have um, Lynch syndrome. And um, we use this some to think about immunotherapies. And then the third category or the third item listed in the pathology report um, is PDL1. It's the combined positivity score of greater than or equal to five. That CPS score is actually the number of PDL1 staining cells. So this is an immune marker. Um, that includes the tumor cells, the lymphocytes, and the macrophages in a combined score. And this is a little debatable as to what positive is in this case, but it really indicates there's a specific indication for the use of nivolumab in the first line setting. So that for a CPS score of greater than or equal to five. So when I, so this patient, um, a standard first line treatment would be the combination of Fulfox and nivolumab. Fulfox is 5-FU and oxaliplatin, again, talked about, um, by the way, on a multiple choice test, Fulfox is often the right answer for most GI cancers. So that was already discussed in uh, colorectal cancer. And um, nivolumab is one of our checkpoint inhibitors. It's a PD-1 antibody. Um, this is becoming pretty common language really across specialties of thinking about checkpoint inhibitors because we see a lot of immune-related side effects. Many of you have, may take, have taken care of patients with some of these. So as I start talking about treatment and goals of treatment, I also will mention, um, sometimes patients will ask, well, what's my prognosis? I don't often kind of bring that up on my own during the first visit. I will talk about, again, palliative versus curative treatments. But if a patient asks me, um, we will sometimes talk about median overall survival. And for this audience, the median over overall survival is probably 12 to 14 months. It was about 14 months in this clinical trial with Fulfox and nivolumab, but it can certainly be less. And I tell patients that the first few months is really a test of biology of their cancer, as we learn a little bit more about how they'll tolerate the treatment and how they respond. So I'll pass to Beth for the next slide. Thanks, Pam. So um, our patient, um, as we just discussed a moment ago, did end up receiving the palliative chemotherapy of the combination of Fulfox and nivolumab. Um, she saw improvement of her dysphagia, reduction in the size of her liver lesions. Uh, she was also started on Lovenox, obviously to treat the fact that she was hypercoagulable from her cancer and had the PE and DVT at diagnosis. Unfortunately, after about nine months, a CAT scan showed some progression and she did develop worsening dysphagia. Her performance status deteriorated and she needed a G-tube for nutrition and spent a fair amount of time in the hospital. She insisted on continuing chemotherapy until she became bed bound due to weakness and recurrent DVT. And this is one of those moments I wanted to insert into this talk, which I think is so important for us as primary care doctors. How do we talk to our oncology partners with our patients? When do we in, you know, interact? And I think it's important for us first to hear kind of from the oncologists, how Pam, do you direct the care at end of life? And then I'll talk a little bit more after you've, you've told, told me how you do things. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think this is a really great opportunity for something we could really do better um, is the partnering between oncology and primary care physicians, particularly if PCPs have a long trusting relationship with their patients. I think that can be really valuable to have these conversations. Um, I, I think that 
usually when someone is deteriorating or if we get a scan like this, it's really important to talk about their goals of care. Um, you know, if this patient is robust enough, we may consider additional treatment, but this patient has really been deteriorated significantly. And if they are bed bound, um, they would be, we use something called a performance status. So the ECOG performance status, if they're in bed more than half the day, they would be an ECOG performance status of three. And we generally would not continue chemotherapy at that point. And so I start talking about palliative care. Often we will have started palliative care in the outpatient setting, even before hospice. That's often probably a good time, Beth, for us to be communicating with you. Um, patients often get confused as to who they go to with questions really throughout their oncology journey. But I would say, especially when they're needing, when they're more symptomatic. And I think having open lines of communication between Onc and palliative care is um, important. And then I would say one pearl that I have around end of life and goals of care communications is that if you can do it early and often, it's really helpful. So the, the slow drip of information around goals of care and around definitions of palliative care and hospice and destigmatizing, all of that is critical and it often takes multiple visits. Yeah, I totally agree and appreciate your thoughts. I think that sometimes there's an extreme stereotype that an oncologist is always going to want to treat a patient regardless of where they are at stage. And I think hearing and obviously knowing that all of us have hearts and are realizing that patients have functional status and family members can appear to see what's going on. And I think you're right, the more we plant seeds of conversation and sometimes for our patients, like if they have other health problems and you're seeing them and then you're like, how is their cancer treatment going? You can kind of nicely insert, you know, what's going on. But I think what's great about us and having Epic, which I didn't have when I was in private practice is that I can communicate with all of these oncology staff members, either through an annoying instant message or just a regular message or CCing a note to them. And so we can really improve our conversations that way. And then if we need to have a real phone conversation and talk to them about like, what do you think for this patient? And should I try to counsel them about end of life issues or hospice or palliation that you know we're all moving towards it in the same way. And my final point on this was obviously when everyone is on the same page and the, the patient's hearing things from the oncologist, but you have these options and they're hearing something similar from their primary care doctor, it can only go better. Because if you've ever spent time in a hospice care uh, setting, like I have as a medical student, I loved it. The nurse said the perfect moment is when everyone is at the same decision point at an end of life situation. So when we've decided that treatment is no longer valuable, but we can get every person in that person's family as well as the patient and the team all saying, yes, this is where we are. We're in a good place. We're in a good place. Thank you for allowing us to have that different discussion, Pam. I really appreciate it. Yep. So um, our last case kind of at first I was like, well, is this really a case we're gonna do? And of course it is, because it's still part of GI cancer. Um, and uh, this is another case that um, I wanted to make everyone aware of. Um, I have a 56 year old woman who presented to a surgeon actually. She had a few month history of increasing rectal pain and bleeding. And of course we need to think about what those things could be, but I wanna insert my thoughts, which is that so many of us as primary care doctors say, oh, must be a hemorrhoid oh, you know, maybe it's a fissure if it's painful, but if it's really a lump down there, it's gotta be a hemorrhoid. I don't need to see it. I don't need to look at it. Uh, you know, let's just talk about six baths and let's talk about avoiding constipation. But obviously this case is a, is a GI cancer case. So that's not where we're going. Where we're going is a basic concept that I wanna emphasize to all of you. When your patient feels a lump in their rectum area, we need to do that exam. We need to actually take a step further. In this situation, the patient mentioned that her pain was worse with bowel movements. On exam, she had a two by three centimeter anal mass. A biopsy of the mass did reveal squamous cell carcinoma. It's P16 positive. She underwent full staging and um, fortunately didn't have evidence of metastases. Uh, her treatment has involved chemotherapy as well as radiotherapy. But um, in a moment, um, I'm gonna, you're gonna see some graphic images, but I requested this of our surgeon, Scott, and I'm so appreciative that he wants to take a moment to tell us a little bit about what does a hemorrhoid look like and what does an anal cancer look like? So as it says here, warning, graphic images on their way. Thank you so much. 
Hi guys. Um, first, I want to basically demystify the anus. The anus is just a part of your body like everybody, like everything else. And looking at and evaluating the anus should be done just like any other piece of skin. In order to look, you have to have an assistant to kind of hold the cheeks apart. And if you lay the patient on their left hand side and you kind of hold the cheeks up, you'll be able to see the entire anal area carefully. And if you look at these, uh, there are uh, uh, five pictures here. The anal cancer one, you can look and say, it almost looks like a hemorrhoid, but if you touched it, it would be firm and irregular. Anal cancers in the anal area, skin cancer in the anal area are just like skin cancers in other places. They're generally firm, irregular, discolored, doesn't look normal. So if you just think about that and you think about anything that's abnormal, more likely that's the thing that you have to worry about and send to a specialist. But look and feel. If you look and feel, you will not make mistakes frequently. Uh, if you look at the uh, picture to the right, these are anal warts. Warts uh, look relatively the same in multiple different areas. The middle one at the bottom are hemorrhoids. Now, if you touch all of these different things, they will be all different. But the uh, anal cancer is firm, irregular, uh, discolored. Next slide. So I just want to talk briefly about anal squamous cell cancer. It's a, it's a relatively faster growing cancer, especially in the immune compromised group. Now that people have been living much longer with HIV, they're now getting secondary and tertiary diseases. And this is a very common one. Anal squamous cell cancer is analogous to cervical and uh, uh, vaginal squamous cell cancer. It's similar tissues involving the similar uh, uh, HPV source. Just to remind everybody, if you test 20 to 30 year old kids, the day you test them, 80% have, uh, have HPV virus on their body the day you test them. So it's very common. High risk groups, men who have sex with men, HIV positive patients, uh, and or people who have immune compromise. And we're getting more and more immune compromised patients with uh, uh, liver transplants and kidney transplants, et cetera. And also anybody who has a history of HPV disease, not infection, but disease, which are warts, both in the front and the back genital, as well as dysplasia of the cervix or the vagina. So there's a large group of people who are at high risk. And I put anal pap smear as prevention here because as analogous tissue prior to the papilloma uh, uh, testing, cervical cancer had something like a 90% mortality rate. And we've significantly dropped death rates because we're finding cancer in the pre-cancer stage. Now, best as I can tell, there are only a couple of ways to do that. That's with polyps and colorectal cancer, you prevent cancer. If you find people who have uh, dysplasia on anal or cervical pap smears, you can keep them from getting cancer. So in the back of your mind, you have to remember HIV, uh, HIV positive, low immune system, men who have sex with men or who have previous HPV disease should have anal pap smears once a year. I'm done. Justin? Sorry, just, just unmuting there. Thanks, Scott. Um, so uh, just to finish up the discussion, because I'm going to change uh, the discussion a little bit here uh, with this slide, but uh, with, you know, with one comment I'll make about anal, anal squamous cell carcinoma is that's because these patients are often immunocompromised doesn't mean that they're not candidates for aggressive therapy, chemotherapy, and radiation. Um, actually, plenty of studies show that they do just as well and tolerate it just as well, with few exceptions. Um, and it is a disease that we can cure with chemotherapy and radiation uh, and, and, and avoid um, surgery. So, so that's always the goal. And you know, surgery is used more as a salvage technique for these patients should they not fully respond and go into complete remission with, uh, with their chemotherapy and radiation, or should they recur uh, later on because you know, radiation can really only be given once. And at that point, you're, you're really reliant on what the surgeon uh, can do. Uh, and I want to use this opportunity as we were talking about rectal bleeding to highlight something I think uh, most primary care doctors have already have noticed and are aware of, you know, uh, in both the um, medical literature and in the lay literature that there has been a rise uh, in um, diagnosis of colorectal cancer, uh, and specifically I'm talking about rectal cancer here in younger patients. Um, this is part of the reason why the screening age uh, has uh, been reduced from 50 to 45. 
Um, but uh, but you know this this slide is just to sort of highlight this is also something you should be thinking about. You know if you're seeing a patient uh, who has symptoms, you maybe you do a rectal exam and you don't really see anything on the on the rectal exam. Um, that we we still have to to, to think about um, you know uh, rectal cancer uh, uh, as a as a potential reason for bloody stools. Um, the current estimation is that there's about 18,000 new cases each year um, in people under the age of 50. Uh, and the um, colorectal cancer has been rising in terms of the uh, leading causes of death and uh, or cancer death, I should say, in uh, patients age uh, 20 to 49. Um, as uh, you can see, this uh, data from the SEER database uh, showing in men, it is actually the number one now, um, and in women, number three. So high, high up on the list for, for both. Um, Traditionally, we've we've known for some time now that uh, that African Americans, Black patients, are are more uh, at risk for uh, rectal cancer. Um, but there have been recently more spikes in incidence in whites, Native Americans, and Alaska Natives. So that gap is is closing. So uh, we have to be thinking about it you know, pretty pretty evenly across our patient population. Uh, the reason for this is still unclear. A lot of smart people looking into this. Have Every uh, conference I go to, I'm always interested in what research is going on in terms of the causes for this and what, what they found. It is really nothing uh, definitive. This is a very complex subject with a lot of uh, uh, variables involved. Um, but but some uh, 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 Factor uh, cause. There's, of course, been a rise in westernized kind of physical activity uh, that we've also had uh, um, young, young, young folks in particular um, change diets, more processed convenience, you know, being used less, less, you know, cooking and less uh, um, whole foods. Uh, being zoomed, uh, and a lot of interesting data in terms of the changes that are happening in our bio. Uh, it's very complex um, uh, that that could be linked here, but uh, not you know not not yet. A lot more to to come uh, over the coming years. So um, so so keep your eye out for that. So that concludes the formal part of our talk. Um, but I hope that you are thinking of questions. I see one has popped up. Please enter them. Before we answer, I just want to put in a plug uh, for another uh, medical education opportunity uh, called Trust Your Gut, um, where on March 16th, um, Xavier Lor and Nitu Kashup will um, present on colon cancer screening with an update. Um, and, and this will involve a lot of details um, that Beth did not have time to cover when she covered the care signature pathway on uh, you know, stool-based uh, screening when it's appropriate um, and uh, reclassification of um, a colon cancer screening to a, a two-step screening when a non-invasive tool is used and um, one of the most exciting developments, the fact that that's now covered equally by insurance as screening if a Cologuard is positive. Um, so uh, we will leave uh, that up um, as well as um, uh, kind of the announcement of uh, next month um, where we will have uh, palliative care um, and a more extensive discussion. So I am going to move on to questions. We have one from Dr. Breyer. Before we answer that, uh, Beth, as uh, one of the panelists, do you have any additional questions for our Smilo colleagues at this time? Yeah, I do have a few. One of them, and I think it, it got kind of brought up with the um, GYN cancer screening, but I know you touched a little bit about using tumor markers like CEA as an indicator of things. So again, sometimes patients get kind of hung up on things. I haven't had one of these lately, but I get the sense that we're only gonna be doing tumor marker assessments after we have a positive diagnosis. But I wanted your thoughts on patient comes to me, Dr. Allard, you know, my so-and-so has colon cancer. Can we just do the CEA level? 
What's your thinking about that? Should I say no? And if so, why? No, oh, I, I don't do know. You wanna, uh, do you want to take that one? I don't know if Ahmed wanted to, to take that at all, but uh, but yes, no. So you're exactly correct that this is really a post, you know, diagnosis test. That there has not been a study showing that this is a good screening test for colon cancer. So, so I, that's what I, I usually advise patients that you know, without a diagnosis, we've never really shown that that this test is going to detect if you have colon cancer or tell us if you're at a higher risk of colon cancer or any of that information. So, so that's um, usually you know how. I would advise. I think in 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 my experience, you know, the the CA one twenty five and the gynecologic malignancy is be, be, because it's used, you know, so so much uh, um, mm -hmm. is uh, more commonly the question that that comes up. But uh, but CEA may come up from time to time, and and everybody's familiar with PSA, which is a, a completely different story. And I would you know, tell patients that there are you know studies showing that that can be an effective screening test. Although that is, as you know, as primary care doctor, still it's a matter of somewhat debate. Um, so, yeah, I would just, go ahead. I would just, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to chime in and, and support Justin as well. And I think that's a, that's, that's a very realistic, I think, um, thing because often, um, even when, you know, you do a screening colonoscopy, you know, sometimes patients have read on the internet and, or whatever, and they'll say, well, should I just get the CEA as well at that time? And, and the answer there obviously is no. I mean, there are very rare circumstances where we will do it without a diagnosis. Sometimes, and this is rare, if we have a patient who's sort of got, you know, this um, diverticular disease that doesn't get better and, and they may have a small abscess at the same time and imaging is sort of, you know, maybe concerning a little bit for more of a, a you know, a, a thickening or a mass-like lesion, we might do it in that setting, you know, before a colonoscopy. Um, and I think that, you know, there are very rare circumstances where we might use it. And I think the other thing that's important to note is when patients come in and they have verified colon cancer by pathology and on colonoscopy, a mass, and their CEA is normal, um, it's important to tell patients at that time as well that not all colon cancers make CEA and that that's an important thing because it's not always, prog you know, it doesn't always portend a great prognosis. Um, and so, you know, these nuances are important and, and I, I love that question. It's such a great question. Well, sometime we'll bring back uh, a group to talk about what is being referred to as liquid biopsy um, in the late literature uh, that is, um, will be on our minds. I I'm going to move to Dr. Breyer question, who uh, points out that um, there was a wonderful lecture, this was at a general internal medicine grand rounds, about the care of patients living with developmental disorders. And as these patients are living longer, uh, is there a recommendation about screening uh, them um, or uh, those who are conserved, for example, um, with mental illness? Um, I, I, I feel like this might be as much primary care as anything else. I don't know. Um, Beth, do you have a a thought about that? I think I kind of look at like what the guideline says and say, how functioning is that individual? And if we detect the cancer, what is it we're going to do afterward, right? So if there's an anticipated process by which that person's going to be supported through their cancer diagnosis and could under, undergo surgical procedure and so forth, then I, I would lean towards it versus someone that has a lot more limited functioning. So I think it's hard. Also, the first thing that pops into my little head is Cologuard. I'm like, oh, let's screen some of these folks that way because it's just so much of an easier process than preparing for the colonoscopy. Um, and that might feel like a cheap out to some of you, but I look at the whole patient and say, let's not put them through things that are not unnecessarily complicated. I think that's a great point. I mean, I've had a lot of patients you know, um, you know, I think we have a lot of patients that are autistic and, you know, doing a prep requires a whole family effort. It's not an easy thing to do um, to support a patient through that process. And so I wholly agree with you. It, it's got to be a conversation between uh, the family, uh, the caregivers, the primary care team about really trying to find what that you know, I always say, you know, on screening talks, you know, the people ask me, well, what's the best test, the screening test for colon cancer? And it's the one that you're able to get. 
And so, you know, if you if you're able to get multiple ones, then getting, you know, a colonoscopy or a Cologuard, you know, those are great things. But I don't think we can be overly judgmental when we're looking at these sorts of special circumstances, because it's a better situation to do a test that is practical to be able to get done than not do anything at all. Because we all know of patients that just say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do it at all because it's just too hard for this individual patient to be able to go through that process. So, you know, I, I think it's a really great question. You know, it's, it's a really. Now I, I, and I, I will just chime in one step of just remember with Cologuard, if it's positive, it leads to colonoscopy. So you, the, the same decision-making applies to even a, a non-invasive um, stool-based um, test. And and Dr. Breyer was also happy with the answer. Thank you for that follow-up. So uh, I have another one um, from Dr. Banatowski. When we order an anal pap, do we order cytology and HPV every time? If the cytology is negative and the HPV is positive, can you talk about frequency of follow-up and where to refer? So we have a, a lot of guidelines for pap smear and HPV as far as um, recommendations to repeat, but I, there, there is less for um, anal uh, pap. Scott, is right, this I you? I can take that one. Uh, yeah. So first of all, there are very few people who do anal pap smears. It's not, a, a, I've taught my multiple gynecologists to do it. It's not a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. No reason to test for, uh, for the, uh, the serology of the virus. Either they have dysplasia or they don't. If mm -hmm. they do have dysplasia, that leads to a high resolution anoscopy, which is a five minute outpatient with anesthesia exam, kind of like a, uh, a colposcopy. So similar to similar. Um, we follow up similar to uh, uh, GYN pathology uh, after, after a high resolution endoscopy and treatment, repeat pap smear in a year again. Um, low grade uh, lesions tend to not be as important as high grade lesions, but the simple thing for primary care docs, just think about one thing. If you have patients who are at high risk, get them with someone who can do a pap smear. And a pap smear is basically a Q-tip in the anus and I can teach anybody to do it and it takes 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. So get, just get it to somebody who can do a pap smear. We'll, we'll follow up the patients after that. Okay, good. I think we're actually at time. It is 5.59. Um, and wow, do I ever want to thank each of our panelists for their preparation and their uh, really great presentations. And I uh, definitely thank everybody who tuned in at the end of a work day at five o'clock uh, to listen, because uh, I know we've made it worth your while, but um, that also uh, definitely is something to inspire gratitude. So thank um, you. And I wanna thank you as well. And, and just Renee, if you can put that um, last slide up, if folks can, can answer or, or um, uh, log in for the CME piece. And if you uh, wanna have any feedback, some of you have provided really great feedback, which we're actually looking for as we think about um, extending this for next year. So if you enjoyed the program, please uh, put your comments on. Several of you have put really interesting questions and have a little bit of an email conversation around that as well. So thank you all for joining us and thanks to our faculty. Um, everybody have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.